Hello and welcome. I think we're ready to go. Um, welcome to the Bankers uh, panel on social impact investing. We're here to talk about, I think, one of the biggest trends in um, investment worldwide at the moment, or biggest mind uh, shift, I think, in global investment. Um, we have seen a surge in impact investing funds uh, in the last uh, probably decade, as well as more traditional investors entering the scene uh, via acquisitions or setting up special units. Um, according to the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, the total of funds invested in social and environmental ventures around the world in 2014 equaled over $20 billion, which was about 27% of global GDP that year. Um, and many would say that impact investing is finally filling the gap uh, between philanthropy and government welfare, with the private uh, sector jumping in to take care of some uh, aspects that you could actually associate more with with, uh, state programs. Um, so how is this coming about and what are the new investment products and practices that are emerging from this and how we really maybe just scraped the service, surface of impact investing's potential, what more is there to come. So to help me uh, delve through this massive subject, um, I'm joined by Matthew Vickerstaff. Uh, he's the head of impact investment banking at Clearly So, which supports uh, capital raising of high impact businesses and charities and funds through financial advisory work. Uh, it essentially is a bridge between these organizations and institutional and individual investors. Um, I we're also joined by Fiona Reynolds, who's the Managing Director of Principles for Responsible Investment, is a UN-supported uh, organization uh, which supports its investor signatories um, in integrating environmental, social, and governance in their investment strategy. Uh, and finally, Jim Roth, uh, co-founder of Impact Investment Private Equity Fund, LeapFrog Investments. Uh, LeapFrog Investments same firms that will bring about positive social impact and it mainly focuses as of now on uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, so to kick off, um, basically impact investing, obviously the key to it is to make sure that uh, profits and impact coexist. Uh, now if we can start off with you, Jim, uh, in terms of LeapFrog's case, how do you make sure that both of these criteria are met and how do you make sure that the um, uh, integrity of the fund is maintained? Sure. So thank you very much for the, for the introduction. So one of the things that we, we always do in making any investment is that we have two filters. You know, the first filter that we have is a private equity filter. So we model any investment that comes into our radar as any other private equity investor would. We make sure that it makes uh, or is likely to make a private equity style return. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is we have a series of social metrics, which we can talk about a little bit later to make sure that uh, we, we, we can discuss those in details, but we have social metrics and we make sure that it's, it meets both hurdles. And we've had investments that can be very profitable but don't meet our social hurdles and vice versa. We don't do those. We only do investments that meet both hurdles fundamentally. And that's really what we've done. And we found a large number of businesses that meet precisely both of those things. Um, I mean, to give you a sense of, of the scale of the operation, we have a, a billion dollars uh, uh, of, of commitments in our private equity firm, and we've made uh, 18 investments with ticket sizes of sort of between 20 and $50 million. And you also make a point of focusing on um, social impact affecting the emerging consumer. And I think that's quite interesting to ensure that both criteria are, are met. Sure. So, so we're, we, we focus very much on the group that we call the emerging consumer. So w what we don't focus on are the absolute poorest of the poor. The group that we focus on is the group that has left poverty and is now beginning to consume. So it's your, your person who is buying an apartment or a house for the first time. It's your person who's buying a car or a motorbike in Asia or a washing machine for the first time. And our, our focus is on financial services and insurance in particular. So, uh, you know, when you buy your, your first house, you tend to need a mortgage. To get with a mortgage comes life insurance. Uh, you get a, a car, you need a, a car loan, you need insurance. And all of those things 
are really significant. They're really significant financially because this is a huge group of people that has left poverty and has now become emerging consumers. So there's a huge economic opportunity. And at the same time, there's, a, there's an enormous opportunity socially to support this group uh, who need safety nets so that they don't fall back into poverty. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's a group that is becoming part of a middle class. And as most of us know, having a stable and secure middle class provides a lot of stability and security in any society. And I think another uh, point that we were discussing just now is that sometimes um, some of the uh, larger, more conventional or traditional investors often see profit and purpose or the social impact side of things as two very separate um, things that you have to analyze, almost a dichotomy. Whereas actually, I know that all three of you feel very strongly that probably the mindset has to change, that when you do follow purpose, profit follows. Um, what do you think? So, I mean, that has been very much our experience, that we, we, we haven't had to trade off typically profits and purpose, and that often our purpose agenda supports us in all kinds of ways. So, you know, as an example, we, we work in emerging markets, and in emerging markets, you often can't rely on states to enforce contracts, right? So, you know, you, you do deals with companies in emerging markets, and you... You pay lawyers lots of money to come out with these huge agreements, but you know that if you kind of have a disagreement with your partner and you end up in the court in Bombay or the court in Lagos, you know, you're gonna lose as you as you as you go through the court door. So you fundamentally reliant on your partner. And if you share the same values, the same social values as the person that you're doing business with, you know, in business or in marriage that partnership and that partnerist, which is such a key part of, uh, you know, emerging market investing, uh, is, is de-risked. I think, I think as well, uh, this is where really mainstream is coming as well back towards impact investing. Because we've, we've seen examples just in our general economy in the UK, for example, hope there's no one here from Tesco, uh, but, you know, really being, Tesco being very predatory with its, with its suppliers, not paying on time, and actually negotiating reductions, which, when consumers actually see how it's been behaving in an unethical, non-impactful way, is, is extremely negative for its overall profitability and share price. Similarly, people not paying tax, so Google, Amazon, etc., Starbucks, not paying tax, being ethical uh, providers of goods, really does come back and, and hits them. But I think, I think in a way that's a negative testing. We're, we're slightly different, actually, at Clearly So, which is kind of ironic given that we are an impact investment bank. The first thing we look at is not actually the returns. We look at, is the company impactful? So is it creating employment? Is it doing good in terms of health, education, energy, the environment? That's our first selection criteria. And that's very different from mainstream investment banks who have a negative screening methodology. We actually screen positively for those things. It's once they've passed those tests, and it's a pass or fail test, that we will go on and look at the overall financial metrics. But absolutely, I agree with Jim. It's profit with purpose. It's triple bottom line. It's risk and reward and impact in terms of doing good, which ultimately becomes a virtuous circle because people do these days want to know that supplies are being paid fairly, that goods are being sourced from responsible... You don't have sweatshops. You're paying your suppliers. You're not paying people who work in, in your supply chain below a living or minimum wage. And that, that is becoming a positive momentum, which actually is a virtuous circle then in terms of prof profitability, because people will feel very comfortable with the profit that's being made because everybody's being treated fairly in the overall supply chain, etc. So um, 
At the PRI, so the Principles for Responsible Investment, as you said, we're a UN-supported organisation and we have six principles of responsible investment. And it's all about incorporating environmental, social and governance factors into the investment process. And we very much work with mainstream investors because we think that all investments should be impactful and all investments should consider environmental, social and governance outcomes. And... This is because if you're a long-term investor, these are risks that are going to end up coming home to roost, basically, if you don't think about them. It's different if you're a person sitting at home day trading. You don't care about the long-term value of a company. But if I'm a pension fund managing hundreds of billions of dollars, I'm not going... I don't want to be a day trader. I want to be... I want to invest in companies that are going to keep giving me value over the long term. And I want to be an active owner of those companies. And companies that are well run and have good governance, have a good board, have good management, look after their employees, think about their supply chain risks, are companies that end up outperforming. Companies who think about environmental issues and um, think about climate climate risk, how they get rid of waste, all of those sorts of things end up being com- companies that perform better as well. So there, seem, there seems to be this sort of thought uh, automatically when people think about impact investing or responsible investing that this means I'm actually giving something up when the, ac- the evidence is to the contrary. The academic evidence shows that when you measure over a longer term that considering these factors actually does give you outperformance. So I don't know you know, I don't know why people automatically have in their mind, have in their mind, because it actually makes just logical sense. Most of our investors are generally managing money for um, all of us as savers, mainly in pension funds around around the world. The pot of pension money is just getting huger and huger and huger. Or sovereign wealth funds that are managing money again for um, for citizens for over hundreds and hundreds of years. And so again, they're thinking about things for the longer term. So if I'm a young person and I'm joining a pension fund today, I'm going to be in that pension fund for something like 50, 60 years. By the time I've accumulated all of my money, I've retired and I'm drawing down a pension, some form of pension. So the idea that thinking, that not thinking about things like climate change, which are material risks to your invest, investment, are not going to affect me over that time period is kind of a nonsense. You need, you, you actually need people thinking about the risks that the world faces. And, it, and it's not just the risk, it's also the opportunities. What are the opportunities? If I'm thinking about something like climate change, as an investor, how do I get in into the ground on new technologies uh, that, are, that are going to um, help solve problems on renewable energies, all of these kinds of things. Same in the social space. How do I get involved in the new technologies that are going to create the create the uh, for the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, tomorrow that are going to con- create the consumers? And the consumers just need a new people who just need some simple technologies to make them to be able to be able where there's no banks where they are. But I actually need to be able to produce goods and sell them. All of those kinds of things. It's all sort of logical sense. Yes, even though it does make logical sense, um, there I think a lot of the biggest institutional investors and the long-term players still aren't necessarily so much on board as you would expect them to be. Uh, so, for instance, there's actually this uh, survey that was carried out by J.P. Morgan and Global Impact Investing Network of 146 impact investors that have a total of 60 billion dollars of assets under management, and only two percent of those included long-term players such as pension funds or insurance companies. So why is this the case? Is it a matter of changing mindset, which is something that obviously is uh, it takes time? Uh, and is it also a question of shifting the mindset from uh, the, inter- the, in- the mm, entire investment process from not necessarily prioritizing a short-term return and having a far more long-term vision? I think the answer to that is that you cannot trade off profit and purpose. I think the moment you start trading off profit and purpose and you have this notion of an impact fund that's willing to accept sub-market returns, 
in my mind, the impact sector, the impact investment sector will struggle because long term, you know, any, most investors, but particularly pension funds and others, have a sense of a very strong fiduciary duty to. Uh, to, 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 the, to, to their pensioners and, and to their stakeholders and they're not willing to do that. So I think part of the mindset shift that needs to go is that impact invest firms that want to make an impact have to do whatever they do. So in our case it's predominantly insurance and we have to do it as well as any other private equity firm in our space if not better. And so we've been able to attract a very significant amount of, of, of funding, you know, a billion dollars from Swiss Re, Prudential, MetLife. And you were saying that your limited partners, the setup has changed over time considerably. And it's, it's, it's changed over time. And, and the reason they're doing it is, there are multiple reasons, but one reason they're doing it is fundamentally they believe that we are great at making insurance and financial services investments in Africa and Asia. And it's also fantastic that we have this purpose orientation and they can see the value of that as well. But I think that's at the core of how the shift is to come about. You have to be excellent at making commercial returns. I think the other thing too is the figures that you're quoting, that's where something has got a label on it that says that it's an impact fund. But if you're talking about money that is managed in a way that considers environmental and social and governance factors, well then that's a lot larger. So of the PRI the pair signatories, we have 1,510 signatories across the globe and they represent 62 trillion US in assets under management. Now I'm not saying that every one of those 62 trillion is managed in a way that is what I would consider sustainable because people get started, right? So they come and they join an organisation like ours or, or other Zuxifs in the, in, the, in the room here as well from in the UK and they want to start thinking and they'll often start looking at their equities portfolio. What, how am I going to do this? Then they'll, they might move to private equity and infrastructure, et cetera. And it takes time and responsible investment isn't really that old. We're only 10 years old as an organisation. And so I think this is still all of an evolution, but sometimes the labels don't help. And I think it adds to also um, misunderstanding about what this is all, what responsible investment is, which to us is a very mainstream investment issue. I think, I think the only thing I, this is the brilliant thing about this space, okay, because I, I agree with a lot of what my fellow panelists have said, and I absolutely agree, agree with profit with purpose. However, the reality is when you get closer to some of these companies, it actually does become quite interesting because I think there is a trade-off between delivering impact, doing good, and actually reducing the overall profitability of interest. We have, for a company, put an instrument in place which, if certain performance parameters, so KPIs, are achieved, which are basically ways of measuring outcomes and positive outcomes, then the overall return on that instrument will reduce. It will drop, which does suggest that there is actually a bit of a trade-off and people are saying that actually if that's delivered, I will take a low return and leave more resource in, in the company to do more of that. I can tell you as well, clearly so runs an angel network which is largely uh, attended by high net worth individuals who are angel investors interesting in investing in companies. If you were at some of the pitches that our entrepreneurs make, you cannot resist but get caught up in either the education, the health, the environmental good that they're doing and you can see entrepreneurs just being taken away by stories. I can think of a story of a, a company called Aduna, which is now it, it's a superfood, which is you can now buy in Holland and Barrett. The entrepreneur involved was clinically depressed. He was in advertising, left advertising, was asked by a friend 
to go and do some pro bono advertising work in Africa, in Ghana. When he was in Ghana, he got caught up in the farming community. And in the end, with a bao bao tree, which is the superfood, became involved in working with women in Ghana and making sure they, they could collect the bao bao tree uh, plant, the, the, uh, the nut. He then brought that, imported it into the UK, and now is selling it in Holland and Barrett as a superfood and giving the value back to the women who used to live at $2 uh, a month and now are on $10 a month. That is inspiring stuff, which, frankly, people will accept a lower profit for because it is uh, something which is doing fundamental good. Sure, but I think that that's different between who the investors are. So impact investing, for example, in the, in the US is really taking off because you've got a lot of high net worth individuals. You've also got a lot of people who have got family money that they didn't earn, so they've inherited it. And so they want to earn a return, but they also want to do some do some good. And if they get six five percent instead of six percent, and they've got you know gazillions of dollars that the family can is going to um, be able to keep churning over for hundreds and hundreds of years, then they will they'll, they'll decide to, that this is this is fine. I think when you're looking at the institutional side, where you're managing money on behalf of others where then you have to look at the whole ESG factors in terms of the risk and opportunities side and you are still looking for returns because as I was talking about before it's managing money for people for their for their pensions and you've got to match those liabilities etc over longer a period and there's room in the chain for for everybody which is the good thing so that's why I think all money can be impactful yeah. in different ways I and mean, I guess <clears throat> I think it, it, absolutely there are trade-offs between profit and purpose, right? So there's there's charities, right? So you, you're never going to make money I don't know, talking people out of suicide or, you know, feeding orphans. That's never going to be a profitable enterprise. And, you know, you're going to need charities in the world and charities are going to have to do that. And that's very virtuous. And, you know, there's, a, there's, there's some line of continuum. I think the point that I was making was a little bit different. If, we, if we're really to open up the gates of the capital markets, my view is that it would be impossible to do that. If we really to intermediate the trillions of dollars that lie you know, in London and New York and really have a huge social impact, the only way we're going to do that is if every impact investment that we do provides the same kind of returns that a Blackstone or KKR or Carlyle is going to return because otherwise they're just not going to, at scale, invest that kind of money, which doesn't mean that charities are not virtuous. That doesn't mean that institutions that trade off in the kinds of ways that you're suggesting are not valuable and worthwhile. The point that I'm really making is if it's really to get to that scale, my view is that that is that is that is the path to that scale. And don't you care, don't you think it's fair to say as well that some of these investments, for example, some of the charity bonds you help arrange, have something like five percent yield? Or even um, I remember when we were at the PRA event, uh, there were, a lot of the panelists were saying, you know, ESG-related investment yields something like five percent. And in the kind of zero percent interest rates world that we're living in, and not to mention what's happening to government bonds right now, I mean, in any case, these are good uh, returns that should, in any case, attract. Uh, uh, investments also from big institutional money. I think so, and I also think if I a lot of people, for example, with their pension fund, they don't know how their money is invested. You know, mum and dad sitting at home, they don't know how their money is invested. But I think if they woke up tomorrow and found on the front page of the newspaper that, you know, their pension fund was investing in child labour or slave labour, and these things still happen a lot, <laughs> that you know they'd be kind of like, well, hang on a minute. How is my money going into these um, kinds of things? What is my pension fund actually doing? That I'm not actually prepared to be making some tiny bit of more money on the back of um, people being in, enslaved. And why aren't there? They they don't understand, and they say, well, why aren't there regulations 
in uh, place. So I think also that a part of your fiduciary duty in managing other people's money is to make sure that you actually understand how the money is invested. And what are we talking about? Are we talking about that we're going to make profit at any cost, even if we break the law or if we break people's human you know, break people's the human rights and conventions that are people. Uh, uh, like, where do you draw the line about how you make about how money is actually made? And I think if we look around the world today as well, there's more money sloshing around than there ever has been. But uh, there's more institutional money. There's more money in pension funds than there ever has been. But look at the state of the world. We had the Bre- we just had the Brexit vote. Why? Because of the growing inequality. Because there's not money flowing into the right kinds. I knew of Brexit was going to come in at some point. It had to. It had to. <laughs> look what's happening in the US. All this money that's there to be productive, and um, and actually do some good as well and make money, then it's just a win-win situation for the whole of society. And most of this money is all of our money that's sitting in city that's sitting there. It's not, you know, it's our money invested in pension funds and insurance products, all all of those uh, sort, sorts of things. And in terms of uh, looking at it on a more technical uh, point of view, in terms of measuring impact, I think sometimes people that are outside the sector are a bit uh, reluctant to understand how impact is actually measured. Um, it seems that a lot of the funds uh, or investment advisories, like clearly so, um, everyone is doing their own specific in-house measurement. Um, how do you go about it? And also the fact that there isn't yet a, um, a model that is followed, a standardized model model that is followed across the market? Is that a problem at all? So, um, yes, it, 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 it is. It, I mean, there unfortunately isn't a standard model. Uh, you know, financial metrics have, you know, developed since the, the 15th century and there's nothing comparable going on uh, for, for social metrics. Uh, the way that what, what we do, the way we, what we look at is we, we look at it through the eyes of various stakeholders. So, for example, we ask if the customers of our portfolio companies are receiving quality, relevance, and affordable products. And then we have ways of measuring that using the metrics that our portfolio companies would typically use. So, for example, in our insurance companies, we look at the speed at which claims are paid, which is something that an insurance company would typically measure. But that tells you, you know, if, if a client has to wait a long time before a claim is paid, uh, you know, they'll suffer in the consequence and that's that's not very impactful. If it's paid quickly, that's a, a much better social impact. If a lot of claims are rejected, it's a sign that portfolio companies don't typically, that the customer doesn't typically understand what it is that they've bought. So we have metrics that look at quality, relevance, and affordability, and then we have other metrics that look at the treatment of other stakeholders. So we look at how they treat their suppliers, we look at how they treat their employees, we look at employee retention levels. So those are the kinds of metrics that we track, and we track them on a quarterly basis. Uh, And we've developed metrics that are not very onerous, that um, derive from the kinds of things that management ought to be collecting anyway. Uh, And we feed those back, uh, and uh, we discuss them at, at, at board meetings and look at how they can be improved over time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we have a, a very we have a matrix, a scoring matrix, which does evaluate overall impacts. And that, that what I would say is, it, it you can you can actually judge it pretty easily yourself. But obviously, applying a slightly scientific approach to an artistic uh, evaluation, there is no capital asset pricing model for impact. Uh, however, it is something that we are developing. There is an alternative, like in the US, they use a B Corp type approach, so you can get um, accreditation by going through a a B Corp uh, induction, evaluating how companies do treat their suppliers, how how they approach ethical matters, etc., etc. Clearly so is a B Corp. I think it's not necessarily a global or gold standard, but there are techniques and approaches, and it's actually something that clearly so is developing as well with private equity and the VC funds to actually have a more 
transparent, objective approach rather than having to do a very long, detailed, costly process, which is the alternative, which may take uh, 12, 18 months to really, if for, for example, for quoted companies, to really evaluate their overall impact. So I think it, I totally agree. It's not, unfortunately, a scientific approach. There are methodologies one can use, and it is an area that is developing quite dynamically, which I think is good. Yeah. We, um, so one of the things when uh, you're a signatory to the Principles for Responsible Investment is you have to report every year on your um, activities. So what responsible investment activities have you undertaken and how have you undertaken them? And these reports are all made publicly. They're all totally publicly available information and it's about trying to hold people to account. But one of the things, um, as I said, we're 10 years old, we just turned 10 this year. One of the things in doing this is we very much measure process and not outcome. And I think we've done that in the first 10 years because you actually have to have the processes to know how to go about this. So you've got to build those first. But now that we're going into our next 10 years, we're very much focused on the impact side. Well, what does all this mean? So we have, if everyone's got all these processes in place and they're doing all of these things, is it actually just a tick box? So I've checked that a company's got a good board. Have I, you know, I've checked this off all of these lists, but what is that? Is that actually doing anything? So, um, I, so we're just now looking at how we build the actual impact side. We're look, thinking about the sustainable development goals. So the sustainable development goals were launched at the UN last year. There's 17 global goals. And um, c can we somehow use the sustainable development goals as a way of uh, measuring out? measuring impact and outcomes rather than process. And I think if we can crack this, I'm not suggesting that it's anyway going to be easy, then I think uh, that could be quite a powerful tool. And when we talk about uh, ESG generally, um, I think a point that is often brought up is that in terms of data availability uh, in, in the companies that you would like to target and invest, um, when you look at the you know larger, more sophisticated companies, of course, that data is available. It gets harder and harder as the size of the company shrinks and you get all, all the way down to SMEs. Uh, do you agree with that statement uh, and how what is the best way to actually make data availability on these types of firms better? I think I think there's a lot of truth in what you say with in terms of availability of information. So we're dealing with PE and VC funds who may have 50 investee companies and may not have necessarily got that information to hand. So it, it does require a certain amount of questioning and actually information gathering but I think in, in terms of when you think that the PE and VC fund is being questioned more by its limited partners, so investors, who we may be one of uh, as individuals in terms of pensions, again, comes back to the point that Fiona was making, you can influence investment decisions. If you want that information, that will drive change and that will encourage those asset managers, PE investors, to gather the information and demonstrate that their, their investee companies are in platform. And that's because people want to know that information so they can make their investment decisions across and, their overall portfolios. Yeah, and we have plenty of basic tools, you know, for, um, so if you're talking about for LPs in the private equity space, you know, we've got a due diligence questionnaire that it can ask some simple questions. But at the end of the day, again, you know, all the stuff that goes on about data, I don't think we want to turn all of the companies into data producers. We actually want companies to get, get on with the business of um, doing what they do and producing. And I think we've got to find the right balance between the kind of information that, that, we, want, that we want and allowing companies to do uh, business. I'd agree with that. I, I think, you know, we, we always go with the principle of not, uh, you know, letting, letting the, the, the best be the enemy of the good. Uh, you know, we, we, we tend to be quite focused, pragmatic. What can we actually get out? What, what information are they already collecting? And, and we focus a lot on what information companies already collect in one way or another, and then think about how we could use that to make inferences. 
about impact. That's very practically how we solve the problem. Uh, I, I think the key thing is to do that jointly with you know your your investee, your portfolio company, and uh, make sure that you know the information that's coming out is not just of use to you, but of use to them. And I think by developing those metrics often jointly and embedding them jointly, uh, that helps get that process and gets you aligned on the value of the metrics. And in terms of we have to have um, a chat about specific uh, investment products that have uh, come about as impact investing or social responsible investment has gained ground. I think one uh, type of product is obviously social impact bonds. Um, they've had very different, I think, fates, especially in the UK. Some have been very successful. Others, like the Peterborough social impact bond, has been a bit of an example of how it could go wrong. Um, I know, Matthew, you have an opinion about this in terms of how, what you think about this debt instrument. Um, is it quite is it quite liable to having problems, especially if in the Peterborough um, uh, instance it was quite um, susceptible to policy change? Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, so just so people understand, social impact bonds are where the government pays a service provider for outcomes and specific outcomes. So particularly in, in Peterborough, it, it really was looking for clinical outcomes on the east side of Peterborough in, a, in a, an area and compared those similar outcomes on the west side of a regional uh, healthcare area because that became the base case benchmark that could, could be evaluated against in terms of the positive outcomes. Was this service provider doing better by delivering a service with those specific outcomes. What, what happened is the borders changed and it became very, very difficult to actually evaluate where the base was and what the improvement was. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, and it is something that government policy is focused on in terms of service outcomes, really payment per, for per, performance and actually bond providers who provide funding for it get repaid over time in terms of the coupon on that bond. But you can see how it can be, if you get the parameters and payment mechanism wrong, it can actually result with a poor outturn, which is the case in Peterborough. Of about the 25 done, though, there are uh, many done in the 20s still, but there are two or three which have gone quite badly wrong. So again, it's attention to detail and getting those payment and performance parameters correct. Um, and in terms of, um, I think, another kind of debt instrument that has really boomed, I think it's fair to say, uh, it's green bonds. And I think this is quite interesting also because it latches on to the argument of how sometimes uh, it, climate is looked at in a different category from uh, socially responsible investment, whereas I think it's very much part of it. Um, but when we look at green bond issuance, just to give an idea, in, in 2011 overall uh, issuance was only $13 million, uh, and in 2015 uh, volumes hit $36 billion. Um, year to date, we're already at $30 billion. Um, would you agree that it's fair to say that this market is truly no longer dominated by retail investors as, as it used to be, and that the big institutional money has really stepped in, creating something that is very, very solid and that can be tapped for uh, green initiatives? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, green bonds are definitely on the increase, obviously, and institutional money is going into green bonds, uh, particularly in a post-Paris environment. You know, you were talking about policy uncertainty be before about bonds, etc. Well, uh, you know, uh, having the climate change agreement have given, given investors strong signals about where things are heading and what governments are preparing to do. But again, it comes back to the issue of um, bonds. It's the biggest market. Do we only want to see bonds of this, you know, this tiny 2% of the market invested in a way that considers climate issues or environmental issues? Or do we want to see all bonds invested in a way that looks at environmental risks? And to me, there can be a danger if things are just put over there with a label on them and people walk away and go, well, I stuck my little bit of money in there. Now, aren't I a great, good uh, investor or corporates, you know, have got great corporate social responsibility, but they don't think about all the rest of the money that they might invest and how that might be 
invested. So don't get me wrong, I'm very supportive of green bonds, but I don't think we should forget about the rest of the green bond market. Okay, if we'd like to open up the questions from the floor. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, the, I had a question that just brings us back to sort of social impact, a real social impact, not necessarily ESG. And congratulations on ESG because I don't, you're not going to win all the battles, but I think you've definitely won the wars, which is terrific. Um, but on social impact, um, if you were an endowment and you had allocated a part of your budget to social impact, putting together a portfolio on social impact, you would want to know that that was going to be used wisely. How can you do that? How can you know that that money is being used effectively in the absence of relative valuation measures of, of social impact? Well, I, I, I think... It, I think what, what the, the nature of your question is going back to this concept of measurement. Can one actually measure? And certainly social impact bonds, you can measure outcomes. In the scenario of the instrument that I identified, there were five, five key performance indicators which were measured on a quarterly basis, and that was a measurement of positive good. Um, consumers were being impacted, users were being impacted. It was recognised through analysis and market assessment that that was a positive feature and that that, that was, in, in your scenario, for the foundation, and there were some foundations who invested in that particular instrument, they were comforted and confident that that was achieving the impact that really was consistent with their mission. But, but I guess what I'm interested in is, is, is it possible to do that across sectors? So what is the return to a social impact investment in, say, child, child education versus an, an, an investment in um, health, um, but for sort of, yeah, older people? So, yeah, how do you, that base case, yeah. how, do you, how do you get to that so, so and I, across those different sectors if you're building an actual portfolio? Yeah. Certainly, in, uh, in, 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 in the case of equity investments, it's a, I, I would say your question is a, a, a deeply abstract one that's perhaps 10 years ahead of its time. Um, the, the, there are very few investment opportunities, at least in the equity impact space for pension funds. I mean, so you typically have a pension fund that will say, look, you know, I can invest a million, a minimum of fifty million dollars, and I can't be more than five percent of a fund. And you know, there's maybe three or four impact investment funds globally that could meet the requirements. And so, there's no real currently there's no real basis for making those comparisons. There's there's, there's so few real opportunities of that scale. Uh, I I I I, I, I think, haven't. I think the areas of scale. Are, are I, I, again, I generally agree with the comment on a, on a global basis, but the areas of scale, certainly housing, social housing, and, and also uh, linked in with healthcare as well. So property related is, is the natural easiest one to get scale. So Cheney property, property Managers has raised hundreds of millions in that place. But you are seeing increasingly niche funds who are focusing either on ed tech, health tech, clean energy, the circular economy, because there is a desire from asset managers to allocate certain amounts of their portfolio um, to those, those sectors. And I'm not sure I totally agree with the kind of, well, you're only doing a small bit, so actually it's not purposeful. It has to start somewhere. And a small bit, to me, is better. And, and actually, although it's a relatively small market, that can grow quite quickly and become a much larger uh, feature. I don't think it's an asset class. It shouldn't be seen as an alternative. I do agree with that. It's a methodology of investing which covers, uh, goes across all sectors. Um, but, you know, the, the obvious ones are are property related to get real scale at the moment. And that's, that's about the only one, although health tech and ed tech also are showing signs of getting real scale and size. I wasn't saying that, it, that, that it, they weren't 
that that because they're small doesn't mean that they shouldn't happen or that they weren't impactful. I'm very supportive of green bonds. I'm very supportive in impact investing. I just don't want an investor to, who's got trillions of dollars to say, I am a respons- responsible investor because I put $50 million over here and with all the other money that I've got, I go and undo any good that I did over here by doing a whole lot of terrible things. I I would like to see, my aim in the world is that all investments are impactful and that all investors, all investments think about projects. But I think you do need some, you do need small scale, some small scale projects that can be extremely impactful and you need people to invest in them. And I, I think, I think the issue about green bonds, and I think it's great that they're increasing, but actually the fundamental issue is do you trust governments we had the Kyoto principles. Essentially, governments push back um, those those uh, long-term uh, objectives in terms of carbon uh, extraction, etc. Is the Paris Treaty going to go the same way? And therefore, will ultimately people believe that in the long term, renewable energy, etc., will be there? And that's where you get people the stop-start mentality of governments and the lack of belief does create concern in investors. And I think in terms of the green bond space, there's also a problem where uh, some of the countries that need this kind of investment the most, and I'm thinking of India, they're really trying to push uh, the green bond initiative. Now banks themselves can uh, print green bonds, etc. But uh, there's also sometimes regulatory hurdles. So in a country like India, one bank CEO based in Asia told me, you know, sometimes if I want to go build a wind farm, to get the permit, first I need to build the, build the wind farm and then I get the permit. And he was saying not many banks will be on board with that. Uh, so sometimes there's also, I think, a regulatory framework that doesn't, it still doesn't help. Well, I think, kind of I think the other problem in India is they say, well, hey, you know, coal is so cheap at the moment because no one else wants it. So actually, that doesn't work either. Um, so it is about making sure that, yes, the funding mechanics are there for renewable and combined heat and power, etc. plants. Um, I, I think the point that I sort of wanted to highlight was just to, to reinforce the point that, you know, it, it, this isn't an asset class. You know, what, what, what we at LeapFrog do is invest in financial services. And I think if it's... If, if people begin to think of it as an asset class, it'll kind of be its doom because you know, you can't make money out of impact. You can make money out of financial services in emerging markets. You can make money out of healthcare. You can make money out of clean tech. And you have to be brilliant at doing those to make money. But there's no, there's no money to be made out of impact alone per se. We have a question here in front. Um, I arrived late, so the panel may have addressed this, but to what extent, if um, climate change in- introduces increasingly disruptive climate and geophysical events, um, to what extent will it drive, whatever you call it, what, to what extent will it drive impact in- investing or not at all? Because the people that are affected by these events are not necessarily the, the super rich money managers living in their air conditioned apartment somewhere. Well, one example of where it's where it's where it's driven is that a lot of insurers, obviously, very affected by climate change, right? Because it just causes havoc with their actuarial models uh, and their pricing, and their whole profitability is undermined dramatically by climate change. And so, AXA, for example, is a group that's um, disinvested from all uh, carbon uh, generating investments and is now very focused on clean tech and there have been another number of insurance that are taking those moves so really it depends in part on where the business is on how it's affected by climate change but I, but I you know if it's affected badly I think it's going to drive a lot of impact investing are there yeah go ahead so, uh, to, to get to make this mainstream uh, and to make it address the trillions of dollars rather than the one or two percent, I think we have to come back to the issue that we addressed about is there a, is there a cost to this? And I think in our experience, we've been doing this for almost a decade now. What firm are you from? Uh, RBC. We do ESG investing sure. in, in global equities or so public equities. The, 
if you are going to day trade or have a very short term time horizon and you're working on short term profit maximization, yes, there's a cost. But I think we have demonstrated, but I think the industry needs to demonstrate that if you do make these investments in employee engagement, social engagement, and so on, there is longer, there is a short-term cost, yes, uh, uh, to profit, but there's long-term value maximization. And you can see this in, in organizations like Google who invest in their people, in their communities, in their environment, and so on, and lead to a lot of long-term value creation. And I think that is the key to, to address it. And, and our industry is very much based on short-term uh, performance measurement, value uh, measurement, and so on. So our time horizon is very short. But if you're prepared to think longer term, even climate change can become a, a very important part yeah. of what we do. I, I completely agree with that. And, I, and as I said, we mainly work with very long-term investors rather than short-term investors. But even there, you've still got the problem. And this is another area where we have to sort of meet move beyond thinking just about ESG factors and think about the under how the actual market works and the short term is an issue because we're trying to talk about being long term but the way people um, the way people are incentivized is often short term so it's about the quarter and so if you were still incentivizing people to make money over a short term well then how can we think how can we blame them when everything's so short term? So there has to be a lot of yeah. If I if I'm getting paid on short term metrics and performance, then why am I going to think about the long term? So is there? I mean, is there a possibility? I mean, on a practical level, that this mindset will change, considering that yeah. the entire financial system is based on sort of a rat race mentality, which is quarter by quarter. Is on a practical level, how do you? actually bring about this change and a realization that long term should be taken into account more. So this is what we're now trying to focus on. How do we actually change some of the some of these things? How do we actually uh, join the dots and try to get longest term thinking rather than trying to be long term in a short term world, which is what we're doing now. Even about reporting and companies reporting on a on a quarterly basis since a lot of um, investors are now saying, well I just I'm happy to get annual um, to have reporting annually I don't need to and I want it to be reporting that's about all kinds of things I want sustainability reporting matched up with financial reporting and so it's going to take a long time but we're starting if, if I may I think let's let's face it this industry is a wealth maximizing industry uh, if we can demonstrate that long-term strategic investing is actually more profitable than short-term tactical trading then you know, people will do it, but I think it's only now that we have the information systems and and you know and and organisations like the PRI needs to sort of pull that and indeed the CFA to sort of pull that information together and demonstrate it for for these to be viable strategies uh, for both investors and younger people coming into the industry to adopt those strategies. And, and that's the only way it's going to change. I think I think though as well there's there's a. In terms of selection, there is the problem with things like the equator principles for banks and, and for institutional investors, there is always a negative screening. You know, transactions are looked at in a financial capacity. Do they make sense? Are the returns there? Are the sales commissions generated, which incentivizes the individuals involved in them? And then you'll get to the end of an approval process going through credit or an in investment committee and it will be is there a reputational risk environmental uh, factor here which means we shouldn't do the deal but it's the thing that's at the last end of the decision which is a negative screening what it should be is far more at the outset a positive screening does this stack up from all those and I think that, that change of mindset will help would help in a, in a huge way I think you raise a great point, and, and it's one that we've always believed in. That's you know, one of the challenges of a lot of the, the industry to date is it's been, you know, remonstration, not demonstration. And I think the only way this is really going to take off is if we if we reverse that maxim. 
Are there? Yes. Go I'm ahead. just sorry. I know I've, I've already had a go, and I'll post it over there in a second. But I just wanted to comment. You you sort of say, you know, the world of finance is a sort of rat race mentality, and I know that there's a lot of that in finance. But finance could be an enormously powerful tool for good, and we shouldn't give up on that. And actually, if people spent time talking to their pension trustees and mobilised the other pensioners and said, we want to do this a different way, finance is actually in our power to control, and we you know we we as consumers can do that and if we give up on it it'll never change but if we ask people to change the financial services system is an extraordinarily efficient system at changing to meet the demands of its consumers and if we say we actually demand a different finance system and different incentive structures it will respond to that in order to hold on to the business and on to margins so you know we have to actually do that work rather than just give up on it and moan yeah I, I couldn't agree more and that's why we focus very much on the asset owners who can t the, the, the pension funds who can take the longer term view they can get their managers to invest money in the way that they want them to as long as there's an it's big enough pools of capital and I really believe that um, long term investors, long term pension funds can actually change the world for for the good and I always think that now that governments also think really short term and that it's going to be the long term investors who will be governments will come and go long term investors will still be there with the liabilities and they're the ones who can actually really think about the about issues environmental issues social issues and governance and uh, i think companies and investors together can really make a significant difference there was one question yes i've got two questions if i may first one is on particularly with regards to equity esg investing any views on the best way to approach it? Do you look at everything and then screen out the bad stuff? Or do you go actively looking for the good stuff because they're, they're actually quite two different approaches? And secondly is on the, the short side of things. I see a lack of uh, people willing to short, so you know, you're willing to buy the good stuff, the good companies. But I don't see many funds out there shorting the bad companies. And in an absolute return world, I'm curious to see if you think there's any demand from asset owners for alternative funds, ESG, short, you know, long the good stuff, short the bad stuff. And there is a lot of academic research that's been talked about to say, well, you know, good companies should outperform. They're less likely to have catastrophic uh, equity destroying risk events. Um, you know, the bad companies, therefore, could be good shorts. I'm just curious to know if there's a, a growth opportunity there. Happy to. So um, I, I, on the first question, what we do very practically is we, 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 we basically, we find, I mean, we invest in emerging markets and there's often not that many good guys, in, you know, to invest in. There's not that many great businesses that behave ethically often in the markets that, you know, it's, it's not such a vast arena. So we can actually be quite, uh, quite rifle shots in finding the great people in, Ghana or Nigeria or South Africa, wherever we, we, we invest. So uh, we don't do a kind of, we don't need to take a sort of more boil the ocean approach individually. Uh, it's a really interesting question that you raise about uh, shorting the bad guys. I do know that there's some, um, there's some funds that focus on, you know, gambling, guns in, in the US and, and others, it'd be interesting to see how they perform compared to uh, others which may be some vague proxy for what you're suggesting but I don't know the answer Just, just into, we, we see about 1400 entrepreneurs a year um, and we do positively screen them and select them um, both for their impact and for their financial returns. Like all early growth ventures uh, they, they may be even pre-revenue. If they're pre-revenue, it's going to be pretty difficult unless they've got incredibly fantastic, impactful stories. And then probably they, they need still to be with foundations or charities at that stage. But we see them going through a cycle, coming through maturing, and then they'll end up being larger entities, which, because they've been so impactful, will, will actually ultimately make it and come through. On the shorting, I'm not sure we would necessarily see that as impactful. Maybe at one level, it, it, it kind of it is, 
Uh, but people do do that, don't they? I mean, people were shorting Tesco, as I said, because of those reasons, and it's increasingly the case. And to a certain extent, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I'm afraid we ran out of time. Um, it's 6 p.m. I uh, wanted to thank the panelists for joining us and the audience for coming. I wanted to tell you also that now in the bar uh, there will be a drink hosted by the banker to celebrate our 90th anniversary, so please uh, go ahead. Um, and thank you once again. I think it's, if anything, out of this discussion, it's very clear that a lot of improvement has been made, especially in the last 10 years. This has accelerated. Uh, but I think the, the task at hand is far larger, but uh, as also the audience points pointed out, especially from the asset sides and consumers, if it's uh, something that people would want to change, then the system can change as well. Thank you very much.